On this week's Visual Studio Toolbox, Aditi Dugar is going to finish our two-part look at how you can containerize your existing .NET applications. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and joining me today is Aditi Dugar. Hey, Aditi. Hey. This is part two of our chat about containers. Exactly. Um, in part one, we looked at adding um, container support via Docker to an existing web forms app we mm -hmm. used. Um, and the whole idea is that we've talked quite a bit about containers on the show lately um, in the context of microservices and the Smart Hotel 360 app. Um, but this is our opportunity to kind of step back and do, again, two things. One is kind of do a more gentle introduction to containers to the extent that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, step back and, and we talked quite a bit about what they are and why and then focus on existing apps. You've got an existing exactly. web forms mm -hmm. app or MVC app. You've got an existing WCF service, mm -hmm. right? All the code that, that, we've, that people built earlier and are still maintaining and um, how does containers fit into that story? Exactly. Um, so that's what we're doing. We, uh, in episode one of this, we created a container. We got it running locally, mm -hmm. which is great. But now the question is, what do you do with it, right? How do you get that container out so that it can be used in production? One way, of course, is to run it in Windows servers. Yep. So you don't need the cloud to run containers. You mm -hmm. can run it in, uh, on Windows server. Or, of course, you can get these things up and running in Azure. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Right? Sounds great. Excellent. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, I think the first thing we're going to talk about is orchestrators. Okay. So, the first thing you want to think about when you're deploying to the cloud is what orchestrator I'm going to choose. And an orchestrator is basically a platform that's going to help you manage all aspects of deploying and setting up your containerized application. Okay. Um, so, there's a lot of different orchestrators out there. There's Kubernetes. There's Service Fabric, there's Docker Swarm, there's all sorts of options. And all of them have their different pros and cons. Um, mm -hmm. But today I'm going to highlight a couple, and those are managed Kubernetes in Azure Container Services and Azure Service Fabric. Okay. And the main difference right now between those that we're going to highlight is just that uh, Azure Container Services is a little bit more mature for Linux containers versus Service Fabric, as it's part of the Microsoft ecosystem, is a little bit mature on Windows. Mm -hmm. um, but Really, it doesn't matter which one you choose. Both of them will work just fine. Right. So I think we, we talked about this last time. If you're kind of new to containers, if you're doing .NET Core, so it's a brand new app, .NET Core can run on Windows, can run on Linux. Mm -hmm. You might choose Linux containers. Exactly. If you're using Kubernetes, um, they're smaller. They're, um, I don't know performance-wise if they're faster, but they're certainly smaller they're and definitely quicker smaller. To, mm -hmm. to create. So your dev work is, is a little bit faster. And then, if your .NET Core app is running on both, then you know that's then you've got the flexibility there. Exactly. Obviously, if you get an existing Web Forms app, you don't want to have to rewrite it as a .NET Core app yeah. so that you, you can, can run it in a Linux container, so that you can use Kubernetes. Yeah, exactly. Right? And we're building on the scenarios that we talked about in the last right. show, which were really your existing right. .NET applications, right. so Windows containers. So we do have Windows support for Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. um, which is there and improving and will continue to improve quickly. Exactly. And so today for the demo purposes, I'm going to talk about uh, Kubernetes in okay. Azure Container Services and focus on that in the demo. But we have both walkthroughs highlighted online, so you can follow them step by step if so you want to. Kubernetes is an orchestrator mm -hmm. and Azure Service Fabric is an orchestrator. What's Azure Container Services? <laughs> Container Services, <laughs> Azure Container Services is basically uh, the in Azure environment in which Kubernetes is going to work. So you basically will set up your resource group in Azure, mm -hmm. then you'll set up your Kubernetes cluster and connect mm -hmm. that into Azure Container Services. But Kubernetes is the actual orchestrator okay. that you're using. Okay. <laughs> it's confusing, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, I want to talk quickly about just the benefits of orchestration and why you would want to use it. Yes. It's especially important when you have things like microservices in your application, but even for smaller applications, it can be really convenient. Um, you can have automated deployment and, of your, and replication of your containers. Um, you can easily scale in or scale out uh, mm -hmm. just online, which is, makes things really easy in terms of deployment. Uh, load balancing. So. Um, you can load balance between all of the containers and pods that you have in Kubernetes pretty easily. You can have rolling upgrades. Um, 
it's a lot more resilient because you can automatically reschedule failed containers. So you don't have to worry about, oh, my container failed and there's going to be a break. You can automatically make sure that there's no breaks in your service. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you can have controlled exposure of your network ports so that people outside your cluster, you can kind of control that exposure. So it really turns out that containers is, is, is very much, is really DevOps. Yeah, right? yeah. That's, I, I mean, mean, that's a Everything huge you just said, mm -hmm. it, I know, like me as the developer, I'm like, yeah, it's great that's all happening, but I'm the dev, right? I built right. the app, right? I hand it over to the ops guys to do that. And I know the DevOps whole concept is to, you know, shrink that barrier and merge those two worlds. Exactly. Um, but in our in the demo we're doing here, and we did previously, we didn't touch the app. Nope. We just got the app up and running in a container, added the Docker support, which made the container out of that app, um, and then you go and manage it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's a great point. I mean, if you remember in the first episode, actually, the first picture that we showed was really calling the sector cloud DevOps ready, and it's really yes. focused on highlighting the fact that this is just really, really helpful yep. for DevOps. And you look at a lot of surveys mm -hmm. of people, why, you know, what they're interested in containers, and, and you find that they're really interested in the DevOps side. Of exactly. They want to use containers for DevOps yep. as, a, as a way of more easily packaging up an application. Yep, exactly. Cool. Um, so we're going to get into the demo now, but just mm -hmm. a reminder of where we were at when we ended last time. So we had an application with a WinForms front end, a WCF service in your middle tier, mm -hmm. and a SQL server on the back end. Right. And we went through and we containerized the WCF service and the SQL server and got those running locally on our machine. Okay. So let's go into... Basically, if you want to deploy to Kubernetes, there's two really high-level steps. The first is uh, setting up in Azure and making sure your Kubernetes cluster is set up and deployed to Azure. And okay. then the second part is deploying your application and all of the resources needed into the Kubernetes cluster. So today, I'm going to focus on kind of that second half of deploying your application actually into Kubernetes. Okay. But that assumes that you've gone through and in your Azure portal, you've created that Kubernetes cluster and you have okay. that all set up already. Which so you can do in Azure. I know you can also do that in Kubernetes. Kubernetes has a whole web-based UI for setting up clusters and whatnot. But you can exactly. do all of this through Azure. You can do all of this through Azure um, and set up the ACS that you need as well. Um, and if you want, step-by-step -step instructions. Again, we have yes. all of that <laughs> yes, laid out on our <laughs> eShop on containers okay. uh, repo. So cool. I'm not going to go through it today because it would take too much time, but um, you can definitely follow this through and be able to walk through step-by-step. -step. Okay, cool. And so there's a few terms I want to bring up in Kubernetes before we dive deep into it, just so we're all on the same page. So the first is pods. Yes. So pods are kind of the basic unit in Kubernetes. And that's really the pod hosts your container. And so you could have multiple containers in a pod, okay. um, or you could have one container in a pod. Um, but that's really the environment for your container. And then there is a service. And the service is really helping you network between the different pods. Mm -hmm. right. And then so last. If you, have, if you have two services in two different containers, they need to be able to talk to each exactly. other. Exactly. Just right. like we have you know, our SQL container and our WCF right. container. And we want to make sure um, all of those services are set up correctly. Yep. And then lastly, uh, there's a deployment. So the deployment is really going to help you automate that setting up, the replication, the deletion, the creation of your pods. Okay. So those are the three key terms that you kind of okay. have to know going forward. So um, if we, the first step in that second part of the process would be to create our Kubernetes deployment files. And this is kind of similar to what we did with our Docker files. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of files that we have to create. Again, text-based, so super easy to create. Um, but these are really just describing the step-by-step -step instructions for Kubernetes okay. to make sure the deployment goes smoothly. So I've created this folder here in the root of my project. Um, so this is where my project is, and I've created this new folder. And the folder hosts a couple different files, mm -hmm. one for the SQL container and one for the WCF and container. they are YAML files. They are YAML, YAML files. YAML, YAML, yet another markup language. That's literally what it stands <laughs> for. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Which is hilarious. I, I think that's great. <laughs> um, so let's go into both of these, and I can walk through what's going on here. So first here, we're specifying 
uh, that it's a deployment, we're giving it a name. Mm -hmm. And then everything under spec here is just describing this deployment. So we have it labeled as a SQL data, so we're working on the SQL one first. And then here, you're going to see this looks really similar to what we did in our Docker file. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just specifying what image you want to use again, um, so that same SQL Server Windows image. Um, and then you're defining some environmental variables. Okay. And then lastly, uh, this part is important. So this is saying that you want your pod to be attached to a Kubernetes node, and you want the Kubernetes node to have Windows running as the operating right. system. So that's where I'm specifying and this that. This is kind of a, one of the many tips and tricks is that when you create containers, you need to be clear. If it's a Windows container, you need to tell the mm -hmm. environment hosting it that it is, right? If exactly. You, you, if you get this running up in like an Azure container instance, it's very easy to tell the ACI that it's a Linux container when it's really a Windows container. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, what do you know? It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time to copy the file up, so you learn a long time after that mm -hmm. that it didn't work because you told the, the thing hosting the container that it was a different OS. Right. Yes, yes. exactly. So key to put Windows and here, you, and that'll help you a lot. Not that this <laughs> ever happened to me, but I've heard of people who, after they did that a couple times, learned to never to do it again. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm told. <laughs> Um, and so then we've specified that this is the end of this service here, and mm -hmm. we can define another one right okay. in the same file. And then the second service is actually a load balancer, oh. and the load balancer okay. is going to do a couple of things. One, it's allowing us to specify this external IP here so that we can understand where people need to go to access this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then secondly, it's exposing this port here, 1433. And this is the default port that right. SQL listens on. So yep. I'm just making sure that when traffic goes there, it's listening in on that same port that your SQL container um, okay. is listening in on. So theoretically, um, you could leave the SQL server on-prem and have to. the mm -hmm. container in Azure talk through it through the hybrid connector, right? You could, yeah, yeah. theoretically, okay. if you wanted yeah. to do that, for sure. Uh, so that's actually the extent of this SQL file, so not too much in okay. here. Um, I'm going to take a brief look at the WCF file and just highlight the one difference in here. So it's basically the same as the SQL one, mm -hmm. but um, we've specified a strategy here. Um, and this strategy is a rolling update strategy. And all that's saying is really that we want to make sure new pods are created before the old ones go offline okay. so that there's no break in your service. Um, okay. So that's Got that's it. really the main difference here. And you can go to the Kubernetes docs and, and find um, uh, documentation on how to build these files and what this all means. Exactly. And, yeah. yeah. Um, we specified a lot of that again in our wiki too as we take you okay. through it, but Kubernetes has more extensive documentation we'll on it as well. We'll see someday in Visual Studio right click and publish using Kubernetes where these things are just dialogue. Maybe, <laughs> it's just like we options. have for Docker. Yeah. Um, hopefully. That would be, cool. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so that's actually, those are the only two things. I mean, we have the add Docker support that yes. writes the Docker file for me and the, and the Docker compose file. Yep. So. This could be we a should logical add this. next step. This would be nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, these are the only two files actually that I need for okay. now deploying into Azure. So I'm going to do this through VSTS. You can do this through the command line if that's your preferred method. Mm -hmm. um, whichever way you want to choose is fine. But let's go into VSTS. So here in VSTS, I've created a new release definition. And this is really, uh, first I'm adding an artifact, which is just specifying where I'm getting my files and my code from. So mm -hmm. all of my code is up in GitHub. Um, so I'm just accessing this repo where the code lies here okay. and specifying there. And then here in this environment, I've added three different tasks. And that's to deploy the yeah. SQL container, deploy the WCF container, and refresh the WCF pod. Okay. So here's actually where I'm referencing those YAML files that we just created. So that looks a lot easier than having to learn the command line prompts to do this. Yeah, it depends. Thing. If you're familiar with uh, Visual Studio Team Services, yeah. I think it's easier in that sense. Um, but there can be a learning curve to just understanding sure. there's a lot of different things sure, sure. in yeah. VSTS. So whatever mm -hmm. is easier for you. It's not that many commands as well in the command line. Um, so I think a lot of people start with that, yeah. so that's easier. Um, 
so here in the configuration file, I've specified that we're pointing at that SQL container deployment file that we just created. Mm -hmm. And that was in the root directory. That's why I created it you know, in that same folder that we were working in for our project. And then down here, uh, you also have to make sure that you had your images pushed to a container registry. Right. So we had them up in a Docker registry. Mm -hmm. um, you could also use ACR. Could, Azure yeah, container exactly. Registry so they have right. options for Azure go. Container yep. Registry or Container Registry, whichever one you want to choose. Yep. Uh, WCF container, same thing, except you're referring to this WCF uh, YAML file that we created. Mm -hmm. And then refreshing the WCF pod is pretty easy as well. And what does that do? That's really just making sure that the pod is refreshed. So it, it's a step-by-step -step process, right? So you're going to deploy your SQL container, and then you're going to deploy your WCF container, but things kind of don't go in sync necessarily. Oh, so okay. you want to make sure at the end that you re refresh. Because your WCF uh, pod is really relying on the data from your SQL right. container, you just want to refresh it at the end okay. to make sure it's all kind of in sync together. Yeah. So uh, now I could go to uh, the releases and when this pulls up, we'll see that um, I was looking at this one here mm -hmm. just now and I could create a new release. And this can obviously be part of your usual flow, you make changes, you build, you release. Exactly. Right? Or you could just use the release here because it's easier. Yep. Okay. Um, specifying that environment that I just defined with those three tasks. Mm -hmm. And then I can choose if I want you know, the latest build uh, from GitHub or which kind of version I want to choose here. Mm -hmm. And say create. So release 10 has been created. So if I go to release 10, um, it's not automatically deployed. So I'll just go here, press deploy. And it's just telling me that release 10 is the same as release 9, because that's what I created this morning. Okay. <laughs> and if I go to the logs, um, here's where you can see the step-by-step -step process. So this will actually take you through the entire process of those running through all of those tasks that okay. I just showed you. Um, but we're not going to go through this right now. It takes now. time. It takes right? you time. You got to spin up Kubernetes. Exactly. You got to copy the container, which as we talked about we just, last time, they're yeah. pretty large. Yeah. So it'll take a little bit of yeah. time. So I've actually already done a deployment mm -hmm. earlier today, and so we can go and take a look at that in my Kubernetes dashboard. So, so now you've, you're now over in Kubernetes. You're exactly. out of Azure, you're into Kubernetes. Yeah, okay. and that's where I can really discover all my pods and deployments and services. Mm -hmm. And to pull that up, all you do is type kubectl proxy into your command line. And what do you have to do to get kube cuddle or however you want to call it on your computer in the first place? You do have to install it before that. Okay. Uh, so um, if you type kubectl, you can find instructions on how to install that. It's like any other CLI that right. you have to install on your okay. computer. Yep. Um, but that'll allow you to access uh, this IP here so, so you that you can... type kube cuddle proxy and that connects... Mm -hmm. uh, that gives you the ability then to go into to the, the browser. Dashboard. And see the dashboard, right? So it's at some point you have to log in, presumably. Uh, no. So no? you've actually, when you set up that whole first step, when you actually set up ACS and mm -hmm. Kubernetes, you okay. connect kubectl there to okay. make sure that those two are connected. So you've already done the login there right. and that connection. Um, so here, because I've already logged in, it knows what dashboard I want to access. It. Okay. Um, so if I look here at my deployments. You can see that I had a SQL data for WCF. I have a eShop modernized WCF, okay. and those are the WCF service and the SQL uh, server container, like okay. we talked about. And those are containers, those are deployments. Those, so that was in deployments. Um, okay. So remember, I talked about pods, which yep. host the containers. So we have one pod for each of them okay. right now, because yep. we've only just done one for each of them. Mm -hmm. And then we have services. And so here's actually where you can see the external endpoints. Uh -huh. So this okay. page is really useful. So actually for my WCF service, I can go visit this endpoint and I can say, 
Hey, yeah. this is that catalog service that I was trying to reference before. Go. You can see so it's up and running. That is now the WCF running. service running in Azure, mm -hmm. orchestrated by Kubernetes. Correct. All right. Exactly. Cool. So I can take this IP, just like we did before, and head back to Visual Studio. Yeah. And remember, our app config file is where that endpoint address was yep. for um, specifying where the service is. So you can plug in this new service mm -hmm. and restart this WinForms application. And when this starts, this is actually going to be the WinForms application talking to the WCF service and the SQL server that are running in the cloud. So we've gone from nice. making it from local containers on your mm -hmm. machine to actually running it in the cloud. Cool. Now, I think we might have talked about this last time, but it's, it's always worth revisiting. Mm -hmm. um, I've done similar demos of modernizing, you know, take a WinForm or WPF app, talking to WCF, talking to SQL Server, and I've taken the SQL Server database and migrated it to SQL Azure. Yes. Because that's SQL Server running in Azure, which is awesomeness. Yeah. And then I took the WCF service and I published it to a web app mm -hmm. or slash website running in Azure. And then the client still sitting on the desktop is talking to the service, talking to, this, to the server, to the data up in the cloud, mm -hmm. which is exactly the same thing we're doing here, although we've done it through containers or the orchestrators. So when... When do I do which? Because the first, yeah. the easier route is easier. <laughs> <laughs> the easier route is easier. I think, I mean, the key is dependencies. I mean, mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the times you have dependencies that are, you need to kind of bake into running your application, and the container is going to host all of that okay. for you, um, which makes it really easy. So you don't have to think about like, oh, is my, like, is it updated? Do I have all the right things installed here? Mm -hmm. um, things worked in development, but is it going to work in production? All of those worries about whether it's going to work or not, or whether you have all the right things installed, right. is taken care of with containers, because that's like a full environment in itself. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the other cool thing is scaling, yeah. right? So it's super easy to scale now, and I can scale out these containers with just a couple clicks. So if I actually go back to the Kubernetes dashboard here, mm -hmm. and go back to my deployments, and say I want to scale out this WCF service, um, right now, I only have that one pod running, but all I have to do is click, say, scale, and say, okay, now I want five pods. Mm, okay. And I say, okay. And now you can see one out of five pods have been created. So if I go to my pods here, it's working on creating those other four pods. Okay. And that was super simple, yeah. right? So okay. all I had to do was go to my Kubernetes dashboard and say, eh, scale it out. Right. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think. That's a big benefit of using an orchestrator as well. Right. Okay. So I think that's kind of kind of good answer to the question is um, if you're just going to stick it in a container and just run it, you know, you could do it either way. But if yeah. you're just going to stick it in a container and just run it, you're really not necessarily taking advantage oh. of all the stuff that containers does, right? The when you get the orchestrators and have the the flexibility mm -hmm. to manage them and have failover, yeah. and you've got five pods running. If one goes down, there's four others running. You can yep. you know, not miss a beat, or you could easily um, increase. So if you're um, doing like ticket sales or something, mm -hmm. right? Tickets go on sale at 10 a.m., so mm -hmm. you know that between 9.55 and 10.30, there's a gigantic spike, spike in traffic, yeah. and that's when you sell the bulk of your tickets these days. you don't days. want it to go down. <laughs> it you want to make sure, up. yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. That's a great situation. And then at 10.30 when the concert's sold out, right, you can just scale it back to, you know, maybe to three because there's stragglers, and then by 11 o'clock, scale it back Focus to one. one. Yeah, really easily. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it was just a couple of clicks, and it yep. does it automatically for you, um, which is really nice. Cool. Um, and then it's also really important if you have microservices like we were talking about yep. before, because then you have so many different things to manage, and mm -hmm. um, you can load balance. Kubernetes will take care of all the load balancing for you, right. so that you don't have to. So think it's about running that. in Azure. So obviously, we're charging for Azure. Mm -hmm. Is Kubernetes charging for any of this? No, it's free and open okay. source. Um, Kubernetes is actually pretty awesome, like that. So it's from Google. Okay. Um, and it's an open source project. Okay. Yes. Cool. 
All right. So Azure is the only thing that's charging you here. Right. For running there. Excellent. And that's actually about it. All right. Um, we've taken you from your existing .NET application running mm -hmm. on-prem locally to adding containers, running that locally, and now we actually have it running in the cloud. Cool. And then the repo you showed, the eShop containers, oh, yeah. there's exactly. a ton of walkthroughs on how to do a lot of the stuff we will point right. people to those. Please do. Yeah, exactly. So the .NET architecture uh, repo on GitHub has mm -hmm. this eShop on containers, um, and this really has so many samples and walkthroughs on how to do this step by step. And if you want more detailed, if you prefer ebooks, you can actually visit our architecture page on the okay. .NET site. And this will tell you, uh, give you ebooks that you can download. It'll refer you to those same samples. And you can explore kind of microservices or modernizing .NET apps is really what we talked about in this demo. Cool. Um, or other things. All right, excellent. Awesome. So like I said earlier, we've done a, a fair amount of container stuff on the show. Um, we'll probably put it aside for a while and <laughs> go do some other stuff. But I, hopefully these last couple episodes, um, if you weren't that familiar uh, with it before I've given you some good ideas on how to get started doing this. And we've really, again, focused on the existing applications. Yeah. Um, the, the Smart Hotel 360 is cool, but it's kind of a, the new modern thing. You've got .NET Core services and Java services. Um, but again, if you've got existing web forms and win forms and WPF uh, apps and WCF services, containers is also for you. Exactly. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.